Thanks for having me back, especially after the response I got last time. Never previously have I been told, and it was immediately afterwards, first by one person, then independently by another, that my talk was too short, which is, of course, quite a compliment in certain contexts. Uh, Leaving people wanting more is reckoned good policy on stage, I'm told, but here I'm unsure. Choosing as tonight's topic, the Lord's Prayer, may make some amends. Its series of sentences, in translation at least, must be the most repeated in history, featuring centrally in all Christian worship, public and private, formal and informal. They're the most outstanding constant in mankind's spirituality across 20 changing centuries. So I wonder why, when um, I confess I'm almost 60 and have attended several thousand services, Why can't I recall hearing a sermon on the Lord's Prayer? And when, I might ask, was the last time you heard one? Perhaps professional preachers feel it's too much for a single session. And yet, it's short. Fewer than 70 words. I've used twice that many already. How many more I'll use, I've not counted, but here's my plan. To look at the prayer as we find it in Matthew. In Matthew, because uh, for reasons that I'll happily explain afterwards to anyone interested, I'm sure his is more original than the slightly shorter version that Luke gives. Before that, though, I want to look at a nagging question put to me by someone who is here tonight. Whether Jesus' prayer is actually Christian or is it still just Jewish? And first, although it will disappoint and possibly offend, I want to explain that an awful lot of material written on the Lord's Prayer, material precious to many, is, strictly speaking, extraneous. Now, very likely, you'll feel that I'm labouring the first two sections and leaving shockingly little time for the third, which is the important one. But what I hope is that in the first two sections, we'll equip ourselves to see and see briefly what the Lord's Prayer really is about. Less than 70 words on the page. Yet, in practice, it swells. There's leaven in it. Sermons may have passed me by, but catechisms, commentaries, lectures... I have read about the Lord's Prayer, and always they leave me a little uneasy. Because invariably, they can't confine themselves to the text. They keep bringing in, importing material from all over. As exegesis, too often it's simply not proper. I do have some sympathy with what happens the way it swells in two ways. But let's consider them. First, it swells because people tend to view it as a bridge historically. So, on the cusp, it can seem artificial to treat it in isolation. For instance, can we contemplate God-given bread without associating it on the one side with Old Testament manna? on the other side with the church's Eucharist. Secondly, it swells, it mushrooms, precisely because that's what prayer does. Open a window to God and doors open to further prayer, especially in this case, since beginning our, and with all its petitions in the plural, this is the polar opposite of a solitary prayer. Naturally, our engagement with God sets up echoes, which resonate in our own engagements with the situations, the people, the predicaments around us. Inevitably, then, the prayer gets augmented, festooned, is how C.S. Lewis described it, with whatever topical thoughts it triggers in us. Not that we've got 
unlicensed, sorry, not that we've got unlimited, sorry, I was just waiting, I think he wants to come in, shall we let him? Julian, it's your church, you're very welcome. (laughs) Sorry. I was saying, it swells, it mushrooms. Not that that gives us unlimited license to roam. In some people's hands, the historical or devotional elaborations do become fanciful. Here are a couple of examples. You can decide whether they're fanciful or not. A month ago, I was reading Bishop Tom Wright lecturing that the Lord's Prayer is a manifesto and paradigm of the new exodus. Admittedly, in order to come to that conclusion, he did have to import material from the rest of Jesus' ministry and also ideas from St. Paul. Then, a week ago, Les, he's a Pentecostal friend, told me a car knocked him somersaulting through the air and he survived. Courtesy he's convinced, of unseen angelic intervention. Are Bishop Tom and my friend Les correct to connect those events to the Lord's Prayer? I'd say yes, providing I can also say no. Yes, any incident when a person is saved from something and attributes the rescue ultimately to God, crossing the Red Sea or crossing the road, All such events share a family resemblance. So yes, they can all be associated with deliver us from evil. It's from that family resemblance, I think, that the bridging effect I mentioned comes. Which means, though, that the bridging is brought about not really by the prayer, but by recognising God's antecedent action. Are such events and such associations, though, Are they what the Lord's Prayer is really about? No. No more than ordinary acts of kindness, or even extraordinary acts of kindness, are what loving our neighbour is about. Yes, they exemplify it. But what it's about has to be prior and deeper than that. What it's about isn't examples, but what engenders those examples. Lewis actually wisely warned people when coining the term festoonings, he warned them that these mustn't obscure the original text. The way I'd put it is this, the primary thing is what is actually in the text. Thoughts of ours prompted by the text or associations we have after reading the text, they may well have real devotional value, but they're quite secondary. And unless we keep that distinction in mind, we can easily, even enthusiastically, read into the text things that aren't really there. To avoid that risk tonight, I'm going to be really unambitious and make only one point. Were you permitted just a single point on the Lord's Prayer? What would it be? Mine is startlingly obvious, and that's embarrassing, because the reason it's startling is that it took me years to see, and yet I now think it's plain as a pike staff in front of one. The trouble is, I suppose I was too preoccupied with the trees that I failed to see the overall wood, the overall pattern. As to how my one single point makes amends for the last time I was here, well, it largely follows on from what I was then trying to say. Talking about the burning bush, I'd hoped to get across that when God disclosed his name, I am that I am, he wasn't just conveying information about himself. Infinitely more important, he was disclosing himself in the only way that can happen, on his initiative. Of course, there was implicit information too as to God's character, constant, faithful, trustworthy, personal as well, since he showed that he has plans and purposes for us. But there's a sort of circle that then gets set up. If the name 
tells us about his character. When we understand his character, we realize that he actually wants us not just to know about him, but to respond. The name tells us about his character. The character implies that he wants us to respond to him by name. And of the many names that the Jews used to address God, the one which most deeply expresses the potential to relate to him was Father. Incidentally, you may come across Freudians who suppose that believers are just projecting and amplifying a father figure. Historically, you know, they are altogether wrong. If that was so, then in early Judaism, you'd have the use of the word father, with epithets of power, majesty, mystery, added later on. Actually, it happened quite the other way around. The Lord of hosts, God of mountain earth and earthquake and fire, became gradually understood to be moral, spiritual, personal. It wasn't. It wasn't that an original conception of a father figure got enhanced to supernatural status. Rather, the numinous encountered from the first as inspiring tremendous awe and fear, was eventually found to have at his heart loving fatherhood. Fatherhood not just for the nation, but for any individual who responded. It was quite a late discovery. It's after the Babylonian exile that the word father begins to really feature in biblical books, in Isaiah, Tobit, Ecclesiasticus and Psalms, and and in other material as well. The Dead Sea Scroll community called on God as Father. So did quite a few rabbinic writings. Jesus' use of the term, it isn't unique. As for his employing the Aramaic word Abba, actually, you know, it only occurs in the Gospels once. That's in Gethsemane. But it's clear that he's being quoted verbatim there. So it's quite plausible that in fact it was his customary usage. Don't be misled, though, by Joachim Jeremias's attractive but uh, overstated suggestion that it can be translated daddy. It's not really that juvenile, but it is familial and intimate, childlike, but not childish. Even Jesus' use of the term Abba, though, even that can be paralleled in Jewish sources. So, How original was Jesus in this prayer? It matters since more than teaching is involved. This expresses Jesus' own spirituality. Moreover, a spirituality that he's inviting us to echo and share. Did it go beyond that of other Jews? Geza Vermesh, the retired professor of Jewish studies at Oxford, has popularised with the public an awareness that there is lots of rabbinical material that exists and pretty much duplicates Jesus' positions. So there must have been borrowing. Always, their mission insists, always by Jesus from his fellow Jews, never the other way round. To reach that conclusion, though, Geza Vemesh does rely on some huge assumptions and assertions. First, consider the dates. The Gospels containing the Lord's Prayer, by universal consent, were written somewhere in the last third of the first century. The rabbinic material is from the Mishnah and the Talmud, the Midrash and the Targums, and was compiled much later, between the third and the start of the sixth centuries. That's so much later that there are scholars with strong reservations about whether it can credibly be used at all for casting light on Christian origins. As for borrowings, what does Vermesh say? I'll quote him. The profound rabbinic dislike for Christianity makes it well-nigh unthinkable for Jews of the Talmudic period to accept and acknowledge as doctrinally sound any doctrine presumed to have originated with Jesus. 
why does Vermish think it's so unthinkable? Let me quote him again. When a saying of Jesus coincides with that of a later rabbi, it's more likely they both reflect a common Jewish traditional teaching dating back to at least the first century. That's more likely than that a rabbi actually borrowed from Jesus. Did you notice how he argued that? That he admitted there's evidence later rabbis took material from Jesus. But so as to camouflage the fact, Vermesh resorts to conjecturing, conjecturing, because he has no evidence for it, that there must have been still earlier rabbis who originated the material. Rabbis unrecorded by either Christian or Jewish sources. There's far too much assertion and assumption in Vermesh's work. But let's suppose that all the rabbinic material is reliable and original. Let's compare. The Lord's Prayer, of course, you know, and we've had it this evening. Here are some of the rabbinic sources. This is from the Kaddish. May the prayers and supplications of all Israel be acceptable before their Father who is in heaven. From the shorter Kaddish, magnified and sanctified be his great name in the whole world which he created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life. From various other prayers, our God who art in heaven, establish thy kingdom continually. Another prayer, magnified and hallowed be his great name. May his kingdom reign. From another, thy name is holy. From another, cause us not to come into the hands of temptation. The similarities are striking, I'm sure you'll agree. But once we've noticed the similarities, we need to start looking for small differences, small but significant differences. Jesus doesn't imply may this, sorry, doesn't employ may this or may that. He's direct. A number of the Jewish prayers do address God in the second person, but quite often they use the third person as well. Jesus never does. It's always thy, thy. Similarly, the rabbinic prayers talk of Israel addressing their father, with Jesus, our father, who leads us, whereas the rabbinic prayer talks of God causing us. Obviously, Jesus is more succinct, and that's not just a quantitative point. His concision and his precision is symptomatic, leading us to note qualitative differences. He's, he somehow compare, combines things that are almost opposite. He's simpler, not rhetorical or circumlocutory. He's direct, so direct that it has a tangible intimacy. He's humble, but the humility makes him bold, a boldness not on his own account, it's a boldness grounded in confidence that God is fatherly. And also, it's an extraordinary combination, but it, it's been shown across 2,000 years. Jesus' prayer is, is both corporate and absolutely individual. If people are interested, I know it's difficult for you to assess just on one hearing. I can arrange for handouts of the various Jewish prayers so that you could compare them at leisure. But moving on, the ingredients are similar, though not quite the same. But even if they were the same, identical ingredients don't necessarily result in the same meal. Anyone who's tried my cooking will know that. Much hinges on how the ingredients are assembled. In the Jewish prayer of 18 benedictions, the sequence of themes in the middle runs as follows. Prayers for protection, for forgiveness, for bread, 
for God's kingdom. Notice how the elements lead upwards. Protection, forgiveness, bread, up to God's kingdom. Jesus' pattern is precisely the opposite. And a very different spirituality results. Jesus' recipe begins with God. It's God's fatherhood that's formative and everything else flows and follows from that. Consider too what, it's conspicuous once you notice it, what Jesus doesn't include. Judaism, under pressure from prophets, came to realise that the religious cultus should be supplemented by a genuine moral and spiritual dimension. The cultus, though, was never completely left behind. Whereas with Jesus, there's no sign of anything of the sort. No religious behaviour is required in this prayer. Apart from forgiveness towards others. And even that, if I dare put it this way, is not so much required as assumed. For it follows directly, it's enabled by, the preceding clause. It depends on being forgiven by the Father. If forgiveness from the Father is the air that we breathe in, then forgiveness to others is the air that we breathe out. It's a natural progression with Jesus. And this combining of forgiveness from God with forgiveness to others, that I think is unique. Evelyn Underhill certainly said that there was nothing in Jewish devotion to quite parallel that. And as far as I know, Geza Vermesh has not come up with anything to show that Underhill may have been wrong. You may not have noticed, but I've actually made my single signal point about the Lord's Prayer, that it all follows from God's initiative. Clause follows clause. That's what I'd like you to think about, how each one leads, indeed creates, the one after it. Each is predicated on the previous one. Begin by accepting God as Father, and the rest unfolds from that. The clauses aren't discrete, they're not separate, they link. They are joined up writing, all issuing from the fact that for Jesus, God's fatherhood is the formative thing. Commentaries and lectures wrestle with how we might hallow his name, promote his kingdom, do his will. But all that is what I earlier categorised as secondary. Thoughts perhaps prompted in us by the prayer and legitimate devotionally, but not primary things, not the things that are explicitly in the prayer, not what the prayer's about. Notice that the opening clauses about God are all in the imperative and the subject isn't us, it's God the Father. So, if we're confining ourselves to what the text says, then his holiness, his rule in people's lives, the enactment of his will are all matters for him to bring about on his initiative. And if the keynote is his initiative, what follows from that? What follows thy will be done? It can't be about our striving, or if it is, it's only secondarily about that. Primarily, it has to be that God himself promotes his will, his purpose. But how can he promote his purpose with us? That would require him to provide, for we cannot. And so he has to give us bread in in the widest sense. Bread, not just for today, but daily, as the prayer puts it. It's a strange word in Greek, epiousios, a word so rare, so strange, that even Jerome was not actually certain quite how he should translate it. He ended up translating it differently in each gospel. 
the reason it's such a rare word in Greek is that it's certainly looking back to an Aramaic word that Jesus actually used. And when we try and figure out what that would have been, the nuances in it don't just talk about today, they talk about tomorrow and beyond. They reach right to the messianic banquet. What God provides is bread, bread reaching right from here to heaven. Of course, if God's going to provide, what he must principally provide has to include forgiveness so that it becomes, as I said earlier, the air we breathe in and the air we breathe out. And from forgiveness, what follows? That we're led by God to escape the final trial so that at the last judgment we will face no condemnation so that we will be delivered from evil, or as some translations might put it, from the evil one. Finally, the prayer ends with a doxology. Uh, That's a flash theological term, comes from the Greek word doxos. Uh, It means glory. So a doxology is a glory be to God type of ending. We, We didn't have it in the reading because actually some manuscripts don't include it. I think it is original, though, partly because I think in Aramaic, if I remember my lecture from 40 years ago correctly, I think you need the doxology at the end for the rhyme system to be complete. But certainly the doxology makes sense of the whole pattern. The pattern of God's initiative comes full circle. His glory, his kingdom, his power, I think, I hope, I've put it in your mind, that when we set aside the secondary considerations about the Lord's Prayer and just look at the text itself by itself and look at the prayer not in segments but as a whole, we see how everything unfolds. We begin to see what startled me when I first saw it, that all the wood beyond the individual trees, all is actually just God's action. There's only one point where the pattern may, to my mind, may break down, and that's actually right at the start, where we have our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The link between God and holiness is where there could be a problem. Do you know that Jesus only once calls the Father holy? There's no doubt that he thought God was holy. Everything he did and said reveals that. But only once did he say, Holy Father. Why do you think he was so reluctant to do that? And I think it's because, for many people, holiness is actually a barrier something they're a bit afraid of, something that comes between them and God. Well, that's the problem. That if we approach the link between God and holiness from our side, if we try to get from holiness to God, it is a barrier and we can't surmount it. We have to let the prayer unfold in the way Jesus does, to have the ingredients in the order that he gives so that it's God's fatherhood that extends holiness to us. That his holiness, far from being a barrier, his holiness is amplified by his making us begin to be holy. If we try and go up towards God, it won't work. We have to rely on God coming down to us. The last thing to say is I missed out the very first word of the prayer. I've been talking about the fatherhood of God. What's required is that people respond, that each of us uses not just fatherhood but our fatherhood.